why I love this podcast is because it's one thing to experience culture, but it's another thing to archive it. Everything is in divine order. There's no success without an L, first and foremost. Yo, what's up? This is Gianni. Listen to Ambiance Podcast. Bow, bow. What up, people? Welcome back to Ambiance Podcast. Today, I got a guest named Gianni Carter sitting to the right of me. He is a DJ producer based out of Los Angeles, but from the uh, Seattle area, right? Born and raised there? Born in Seattle, raised in Oregon, actually, Eugene. Okay, all right, we're gonna have to get into that, man. I just, I'm excited to talk to you, and I kind of talked to you a little bit about this off camera about how you're an athlete, Mm -hmm. and I feel like you've lived probably many different lives up to this point right now, so I'm sure that there probably has to be many different experiences that come along with that. Yeah, no, for sure. As as you're probably well aware of, so I'm, I'm excited to get into that. But first, just want to talk about like the beginning, man. What first started for you? I know you like you were first an athlete and then got into the music, or how did that so honestly, happen? First, first a um, musician and then went into an athlete actually. So oh, really? I, I started. I played violin as a kid. Then I went into a piano, and then in sixth grade, I wanted to um, be a DJ. Okay. So you know, Santa hooked me up, got me some, <laughs> got me some turntables. I was I was rocking um, some Newmark turntables, doing all vinyl. At what age were you? I was in sixth grade, so was that? 12, 13? 12, 13, Something yeah. like that, okay. Yeah, and so I just had like all my dad's old records. The first record I bought was 50 Cent, Get Rich, Get Rich, Try, or, Get Rich or Die Trying. Okay. And then I got um, Snoop Dogg, Doggy Style, and then DMX. I forget the DMX album, but those were my first three wow. that I bought. That was yeah. a certain era back then when 50 was popping, right? 50 and, was popping, man. I, yeah. I remember just going through that whole, <laughs> that whole album, man. And uh, yeah, that's what, that's what got me started. I had some lessons at a guitar center and then just like a little DJ book and that's what got me going. Did you, were your parents musically inclined? Is that why they put you in? Yeah, my mom originally was a, a voice major in college. So she went to school for, she was doing opera. Oh, wow, she's doing yeah. opera, okay. Yeah, so you right. have some like musical genes. Yeah, and then my dad, my dad, my biological dad was an athlete, so oh. I'm trying to you know live both of their lives. It's in your blood, then. Yeah, a Renaissance man. Yeah, <laughs> as they would say. Yeah, exactly. Are you so? I I know you notice you have a Filipino hat. This is it, Adrian's. Actually. Adrian's hat. Okay, that's yeah. why I was like wondering: Are you Filipino or what's your ethnicity? So my my mom's Italian, and then my dad's black. But okay, um, my mom got my dad died when I was young. My mom mm, RIP. Married, yeah, uh, my mom got remarried when I was like real young, five, four or five. And my stepdad's from Italy as well. So my whole family like really that raised me, um, all Italian. Wow. So we speak, speak Italian, go to Italy. We, we go every year. Um, when I was a kid, we go, you know, summer, spend a lot of the summer there. And so, yeah, man. It was, it was That's pretty, pretty cool. rare, like a unicorn. Yeah. So there's a lot of deep culture rooted in Italian culture, as I'm sure. So, yeah. like, how did, how did that have an effect on things as you were growing up? Dude, it was just, I mean, just like kind of like the immigrant culture where you know you go to school I went to Catholic school my whole life and um, you know just kind of being like the outcast already because I was in Eugene black but also Italian yeah you know that was like a whole nother thing the biracial aspect is pretty big I'm sure right yeah and just like the fact that my family was from Italy you know what I'm saying like yeah they didn't have like the same you know culture and same they they weren't doing the same thing that a lot of the kids in my class were you know like Mm -hmm. when I brought food from home it was like kind of weird because like it was Italian food, you know, but yeah. it was like homemade Italian food. You know? That's crazy, man. Yeah, yeah so. and I'm sure like not many people have that type of like mix within their ethnicities. So it's it's kind of yeah. hard to relate to people because do you know anybody else like besides your family that kind of has that type of tie? Like Italian black? Yeah. You know, it's funny. I had like a whole phase where I was like looking it up and like I know Crazy Bone or was it Busy or Crazy from Bone Thugs and Harmony? Or Italian and black. One of them. I don't know. Yeah, one I'm of them. Not sure. Yeah. One and of them. There's did. a couple others. I, I'm meeting more and more nowadays. Okay. But more on the East Coast. You know what I'm saying? Got you. So you were talking about um, how 50 DMX and uh, you had another album. Snoop. It was Snoop. Snoop. Yeah. yeah. Had an effect on on your, your first. Was, was those, those were the first three kind of albums that you were mixing on the New York? Or yeah. how was it? Yeah. Those were the first three that I was mixing on the, on the turntables. I don't know why I got the I, 50 Cent, I know, for sure. But the other two, I just kind of, I, I think I liked the cover, the album art. And I was like, okay, I'm going to buy it, you know? It was based off of that. Yeah, it strictly. was based off of that. And, uh, and those were the only three that I really bought on my own at that time. You know what I'm okay. saying? So. Yeah, so when you, when you started growing up a little bit more, when you got to high school, I'm sure, 
were you in a situation where you were dedicated more to football and you started that football lifestyle or, or how did that yeah. transcend? Honestly, after sixth grade, like I was always playing sports, but like sixth, seventh grade, seventh, eighth grade, I really was in basketball. Basketball. Oh, really? And I wasn't even going to play football. And my, my coach was like, you got to play football. If, he's like, if you want to go D1. Did football. you have size back then too? Yeah, I mean, I was like six, six one, a okay. freshman, you know what I'm saying? Um, but my coach was like, yeah, you got to play football. And so they got me to play football, did well, won state my freshman year. Wow. Um, yeah, in one state my junior year, one state in basketball my junior year. And then from there I was like, ah, forget music. <laughs> I'm gonna come back to you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm yeah, trying yeah. to get to the league, so yeah. So that was the goal back then, you wanted to, you had league aspirations yeah. back then. Okay, yeah. yeah, I'm sure you must have been doing pretty well then. Yeah, to, no, I was, I was doing pretty good. You know, in Oregon, so it's relative. How know? is it out there compared to like, cause California is such like a Goliath power, high school type of state. How is it in Oregon? Not California, bro. Really? <laughs> it's not California. Like, we got really good basketball. Okay. And we have pretty good, you know, Justin Herbert was from around the way. You know what I'm oh, saying? Oh, he was, like, even born in that yeah, area, yeah, too? Yeah, okay. right around the way. He went to Sheldon. Wow. Um, a couple a couple other people in the NFL, but, um, but yeah, no. It, there wasn't a lot. I, my biggest com- com- competitor at the time was Jordan Poyer. Jordan Poyer, wow. He's a starting safety for uh, the Bills. Yeah, yeah, well aware. That's crazy. Yeah, that was my dog. We <laughs> go to all the camps together. There was a couple, there was a couple good, my, my high school had a lot of good um, players, a lot mm-hmm. of D1 players, which was really rare, rare in Oregon. I bet, and yeah. And in Eugene, and I'm from my high school, so, yeah, it was pretty cool. That must have been like a certain time, you know what I mean, that hasn't happened again. <laughs> Dude, I don't think it, I, I went back and I was like, man, this is the Bro, same thing. I think the same thing, to be honest. I don't know if I'm jaded or if we're jaded just by like, oh, like our times we were like the best or whatever. But when I look at like kids now that are in high school, I'm just like, everyone looks smaller? so small. Like yeah. they all look like young and super small, but I don't know if like other people think that too. If like the generations above us look at us and they're like, you guys are so small and shit. Dog, I, I agree hundred percent. But you know what's weird though? I feel like that in every sport but basketball. Really? I feel like they're just getting bigger and that's like- true. More skilled. More skilled, bro, it's crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's crazy. that's a good point. I never really thought about it like that. Man, so high school happens, you have these great seasons and then you end up getting a scholarship to the University of Mon- or Mon- Montana State, right? Montana State, yeah. Okay, how did that transpire? Um, so I had been I had been recruited by a couple colleges. Um, I was really stuck on Cal, and they had offered me, but then rescinded my offer. Oh, they did. Yeah, and then the why UW, did they rescind your offer for? They offered too many receivers. They oh. said I don't know. It's one of those shit. things. Um, and then the UW wanted me to play safety, and I didn't want to play safety. I want to play receiver. So oh, wow. I decided to go to Montana State. Um, they gave me a full ride. And yeah, so I was like, man, I've never been to Montana. I took my visit there. I was like, it's cold, but we'll, we'll make a rock. And um, went there, tore my LCL the first oh, no. year. Yeah. I hate to hear it. First uh, in camp. In camp too? Playing basketball. Oh my gosh, bro. In between two a day. Your I coaches know. must have been pissed. <laughs> yeah, I didn't tell them that it was they're playing basketball. Oh, really? You just no. saw like an accident or something? Yeah, I was like, oh, I sprained it in, in practice. Probably smart. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I don't yeah. blame you. I'll do the same thing. Yeah, bro. So from there, you know, they recruit over you, you come back, and I uh, came back my sophomore, or my redshirt freshman year, so my sophomore year, and um, I was like, man, they recruited over me, I got to transfer. So I transferred to Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, which is another, like, smaller D1 school. Okay. And I uh, had to sit out because the NCAA, um, but then the last two years, man, balled out. That was back when they had that rule implemented where if you transferred, you had to sit out, right? For mm-hmm. your, now, it's not like that, right? No, it's crazy now. You can just go every year, you jump to another school. It's crazy. <laughs> Insane, right? I don't know. I don't know if that's good or bad, but I, I mean, I, I don't know. I guess it, if the all the powers with the athletes now, right? Yeah, exactly. All the powers of the athletes, which kind of is, I feel like, just very uh, parallel to how other things are happening in life. Like, Power is going to in indie artists and yeah. individual creators rather than the like corporate companies. So yeah. it's funny how that's kind of switching from like like a monopoly of one power to like all of the individuals now are holding the power, right? Yeah. Do you notice that too? Oh, absolutely. I mean, just just working with artists and you know producing for artists and then seeing how it the whole structure like is is looks flipped on its head. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. It's crazy. In the 
and at the University of what was it? I, I don't know how to pronounce it in Pittsburgh. Duquesne. 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 How yeah. was your How was your lifestyle there? I know you were involved in like a, a frat and yeah, and that, had all those works going on. So what was that going? It was cool, man. I, I think transferring to Pittsburgh, I was really bummed at the time when I first when I first had to transfer because I I really got pushed out of Montana mm. um, with the injury and stuff like that, and like they were, I was just like damaged goods. You know what I mean? So when I got to Pittsburgh. It's funny because my mom grew up there. My mom oh, went wow. to the college there. At, she went to. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. So it's crazy. It just ha- it was. I transferred so late. It was like the last place it would give me a scholarship to. Wow. You know, I'm I'm talking about. I probably transferred July. Oh damn, that's pretty unheard of. Yeah, yeah. At that time. So um, so I transferred, man, and it just worked out. Like I was in a frat, you know, black frat. Got really in touch with my black side. Um, you know, black student union, all these different things that like really gave me a, another experience that I really didn't get to experience in Montana. Yeah, I mean? so, so it was kind of a blessing in disguise then. It was a blessing, man. It was just one of those things that like, now when I look at my life and I look at all the, you know, all the downs that I've mm-hmm. had, it's like they've all really shaped me and they've all turned out to be better than what I was expecting. Yeah. You, know, you, you, you have, you know, yeah, it's just crazy, man. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm, I've had some similar situations as you, funny enough, in like my athletic career. Mm-hmm. And we'll get into like the creative and the, the music stuff for sure. Yeah. But to, to kind of relate to that story for me, when I, I told you off camera, I went to Mount San Antonio College, it's a community college over in uh, the LA area, played my two years there. I actually had offered to Montana to Fire. go play football there, not Montana State, Montana Grizzlies. Yeah, yeah. And I ended up getting this weird like bacterial infection on my skin. And mm. it was like the weirdest thing ever. I didn't know what it was. So I was prepping in between the, uh, the fall and spring semester after my season was over to go there. So I was working out super hard. And what I didn't know is that this bacterial infection that I had, that I had was spreading because I was sweating. So it kind of spread throughout like my entire body. Wow. Yeah, and it ended up getting so bad that by the time it was... It was by the time it came for me to move to Montana and like get a physical and start that whole process, Mm -hmm. I couldn't even like pass the physical. So I wasn't even healthy enough to play. So they ended up telling me, we're gonna revisit your situation and your offer after the season's over. So I'm like, all right, bet. Kind of waited it out, got healthy. Season came, and then they had that conversation with me. They're like, we gave your your offer away. You're kind of like shit out of luck. And then here I am now like, I have no interest. Like, what am I gonna do? I can't like really can't really just hit up schools to go to. So I tried to, I was hitting up a bunch of schools and um, ended up contacting Colorado State. They gave me a walk-on opportunity and I took it and then ended up getting a scholarship after that. But I feel your pain, bro, with the rescinding of the offer. That shit hurts. Yeah, bro, it hurts. <laughs> but you know what? That's part of the journey. You know what I mean? And you don't realize that you're so focused on you know, I want to make the, I want to make it to the league, and the way to do it is this. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And you don't realize that, you know, me transferring to Pittsburgh, I got a whole nother opportunity. That's then true. the Steelers were there, bro. I got picked up as a free agent. Oh, for you the did? Steelers. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. after after you had how many seasons at the college? Uh, so I had two that I got to play. I had to sit out one. Okay, got two that you got to play. Mm-hmm. You ended up getting some like looks from NFL teams. So you got yeah, okay. I had I had about twelve teams. Um, they were coming to all our practices. Wow. Yeah, me and the, there was this kid, Dorian Bell, who was really good at the time. He sounds very familiar. He was the number one linebacker in the country, like in 09. When oh, I wow. Came out of high okay. School. Yeah, he sounds he familiar. To, um, he went to Ohio State, and then he, uh, him and, you know, he got in trouble with the whole ring, selling the rings. And stuff oh, like that, that whole thing. Got and you. So, um, yeah, so we transferred at the same time, and it was like, it was perfect, you know, because mm-hmm. we kind of fed off each other. We both had really good careers once we transferred there. And Steelers were there. There were so many teams that would come. And so, yeah, got a little opportunity, got my little 20 minutes, hey. you know, <laughs> Steelers, Raiders. Then I actually went to Colorado. I was actually living in, um, I played for the Crush for a second. Wow, so yeah. that was that Arena League or what mm-hmm. was that? The okay, arena. damn. Did, did the Crush, did the Rattlers, then went to Texas, and then I was like, man, I'm not doing Arena Bro, anymore. you had a whole football. Yeah career and lifestyle I didn't know that that's crazy yeah it was it was a journey man yeah you know? so what was uh what was your final like realization of that like I'm just gonna kind of leave this behind and move on to something else well it was just I got rid of my agent and you know he had been sending me to arena teams and I was like man I don't want to go to arena like I want to be in the league like help me get to another team at least a tryout you know what I mean mm-hmm. um 
and he was like, oh yeah, 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 whatever. So we, <laughs> I was like, look, man, I'll represent myself. You know wow. I mean? Okay. So um, real like indie type shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, like come on, I'll just I'll look out for myself. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And um, uh, after when I was in Texas, it just like wasn't. I was like, man, this this is like, this is not what I'm signing up for. You know, I like I have I have a degree. I have all these other interests that I haven't really gotten able to, I wasn't really able to, um, you know, do when I was playing sports because it was all the time, sports, training, sports, training, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so that's when I really turned to music. Um, I went back to Pittsburgh. I had a girlfriend at the time and, you know, I was just like focusing on music, got a job doing like some financial advising. Okay. Like Northwestern Mutual. So were you, sorry to cut you off, but like when you were in college and when you were just like living this whole athlete lifestyle, were you like cognizant of like doing anything else but trying to make it? No, nah, I wanted to make it, that's all. I was DJing. Oh, in college you were DJing? I was DJing all the parties, the frat parties, the football parties, everything. And then I'd also do, we do like freestyle, freestyle Fridays. And I'd, I'd be at the house spinning, throwing beats oh, on, no and people way. come over and rap. Yeah, like that? And, yeah, we used really to like do that. <laughs> rap yeah. battles? Yeah, man. It was fun, bro. It was fun. It was fun. But I wasn't really in, like, my producer bag. Okay. You know, I, when I really got into that, when I moved to L.A., I went to a um, music production school. Called oh, Beat you did? Lab. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Called Beat Lab Academy. And um, actually, Mike Parvizi from Penthouse Penthouse. I don't know if you know the, the band. Big on SoundCloud. Um, part of Team Supreme with like Carmack. You're very, very familiar with them, yeah. Yeah, um, he was my music instructor. Wow, okay. Yeah, and so after work, um, I'd just go there and, 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 you know, from six to 10, I think it was, like twice a week, and just honed my skills, learned how to use Ableton, uh, mixing, mastering, producing, and some, you know, music theory and stuff like that. Were you, so when you were kind of backtracking to Pittsburgh, were you like, intentional with wanting to make it in music or were you just kind of like exploring it as more of a hobby well that around that time is when i really got plugged in with like selection okay and um and what so year was, was that about like 20 probably 2014 2013 2014. okay so early on yeah and so i was listening to a lot of selection soundcloud k Trinata was the first thing i heard then i heard sango then i heard you know joe k's that Show. whole era back then of it like was sound a time, bro. Yeah. It was, there was nothing like it mm -hmm. you know and in pittsburgh there wasn't a lot of people that were really pushing the sound yeah you know absolutely what I'm saying? so i got with a couple people a couple friends and we like made this little collective and we were gonna make our own like little radio show you know everybody did it you yeah know? absolutely so we had our little thing um called the odyssey club and we would just put you know do events and stuff like that in, in pittsburgh in pittsburgh okay. and like really try to push that sound and it was, you know, we had a little community. It was a small community. <laughs> really? You know what I'm saying? So small. Really? People are like, what are you listening to? Oh, my gosh. You know? Well, that's like, at that time, people weren't hip to it, and yeah. it was kind of like a foreign thing. But looking at it now, it was so future, like, forward thinking as, like, what selection is. Yeah. But, like, back then, it was just like, I used to be hip to it back then, too. And I would get the same looks from a lot of people, just like, what is this? Like, yeah. blah, blah, was like... You don't even know. <laughs> yeah, bro, just wait. Yeah, just wait. And now look at it. Yeah. <laughs> it's Facts, like the man. sound. A lot Facts. of like big artists are like starting to to make music and like get on beats that are similar to this type of sound. And it yeah. just goes to show like how that wave, how like early like selection in this whole like neo soul wave was like early on. Yeah. It's it's crazy, man. It's it's like a lot of those people that were like, What are you listening to? Now their favorite artists are from, you know, had their start really at selection yeah and it's, it's really cool um like it's just cool it's cool to be around these guys now too you know what yeah I mean? like a lot of them are my friends mm -hmm. and it's just crazy because i'm fans of theirs you know yeah. and like like we were talking about off camera like a lot of the people that you've interviewed and stuff like that i was fans of and now are friends of mine you that's know pretty I mean? crazy yeah that whole circle i feel like your whole circle and community is kind of involved in this type of sound that you've championed since like the beginning right yeah so let's talk about that so you were in pittsburgh you started you know throwing those events had that little collective mm -hmm. what kind of uh brought you to la what was the initial like spark of interest that led you to come out here yeah, so I was just, I was in Pittsburgh. I was like, not playing ball anymore. I was getting so annoyed, because you, know you know the cycle. Once you're done with ball, and you're with, when you're done with that part of your life, people still associate you with that. 
Yeah, it's and a huge you, identity crisis. It's a huge identity crisis, and it's not talked about enough. You know what I mean? I don't. I think athletes need something to kind of distract them from that because you put so much of your time and your effort into it, and then all of a sudden it's gone out of nowhere. Like there's no like and transition people period. asking you about it, and you're like, That's "Does true. this make me a terrible like?" Stop asking me. You yeah, know what I mean, man. I remember getting mad when people were like, "What are you doing now?" You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. it made me feel like a terrible, like a failure. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um. So during that time, I uh, I was like, you know, I want to move back west, but I don't want to go to Oregon. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to go to Seattle. I have a lot of friends in LA. I want to do music, anyways. So why don't I move there? So that's what I did. Okay. So yeah. what year was that that you made the first move? I think it was 2016. 2016. Yeah. Okay, so you moved to LA. What was the next kind of step for you towards the music? Was it kind of enrolling in that in that yeah. music school? Yeah, man. Uh, I like I said, I was just I was having an identity crisis. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I went to school for business. I was like, all right, maybe I'll do pharmaceutical sales. You know, couldn't get a job in that. <laughs> I moved here. I was a manny, bro. You were a manny. Somebody got me a job as a manny. Oh, so is that nanny before a man? Yeah. Oh no way! Did you do any gigs as a man? Bro, I like I only did one. I'm not saying like I advertised that, but like somebody was like, "Yo, we need a nanny," and I was like, "All right." Yeah, at that point, you're probably willing to. I was willing to do anything, so I I did that, and then I started working at Enterprise, like every athlete does. Yeah, that's very true. They, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They, they headhunt the athletes pretty they hard. They do. They have yeah. a good sales program, so I was like, whatever. Did that. And then while I was doing that, I was going to music school. Okay, you're going night. to music school. So at this time, were you kind of already hip to a lot of the sounds that you were previously put onto at this music school? Or like, how did this music school have an effect on your musical like diversity and your whole sound in general? Well, it was cool because Mike Parvizi was my teacher. I was a fan of Penthouse Penthouse. And like they were tapped, they were friends with all the selection dudes, and like a lot of the people in my class were championing that sound as well. Okay. We're, we're pushing that sound, you know. Like we want to make sound sound like we want to make songs like this, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I made a couple friends, um, Van Grant, Bla- uh, blessed. Oh, blessed. Okay, yeah. yeah. He was so he was in that school too. No, mm-hmm. okay, we was in that cool. school together. Uh, a buddy of mine named Damon Steele, who's like a dope um, electronic uh, music producer. DJ, I met him as well. We mm-hmm. would carpool every day, and we would just put each other on a different songs. Oh, really? All day. That's yeah. a, that's a was, love language, man. Yeah, it was like a, you know, hour and a half. It was an Eagle Rock. Oh shit! So we so would just pushing. all day. We'd just be dropping songs. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I love that. Some of my best friendships. I feel like some of your best bonding moments with people is over sending each other music. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, man. So it was cool. It was it was really cool to to be around that and the 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 teacher Yuda, another teacher. Um, he was just a genius, man, and he just taught us everything. And now I feel like, you know, like a computer programmer when it comes to oh, like. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. what? How long did it take for you to kind of pick up on like learning these skills with Ableton to fast forwarding to like you actually being able to make beats and put songs out on SoundCloud? You know, it took me a long time to feel like I was good enough to put it on SoundCloud. Like, oh yeah. I had songs. I have still, I have so many songs that I haven't released. You're just sitting on them? Just sitting on them. Because it's like, is it ever really done? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. Like, is it good enough? And in your head, you hear it so many times, it's like, this isn't good anymore. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it took me, you know, during that class, once, by the time it was done, I felt really comfortable around Ableton. When okay. I started, I was looking at Ableton and I thought it was like, coding. You know what I'm oh, saying? Oh, yeah. Because like, it looks intimidating, it's if, intimidating to the like naked eye. But now, like you, you learn all the short keys, and you, you, you know what I'm saying? It's, that's a game changer. It, yeah. Workflow and like knowing short keys. Really? Oh my god! It was, it was. It took a lot, man. It took a lot to definitely sit down. You know what I mean? Because I, I feel like even now, I have so many friends who are like, "Yo, I want to start producing. How do I start?" And it's like, bro, YouTube University. Yeah, that's how you. Bro, <laughs> you can learn anything. Yeah, you absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Google <laughs> anything, bro. You absolutely. can learn anything. If you like, if you just put the time and dedicate the time, and know that at first you're not going to be that good, mm-hmm. but you have to learn. You have to go through that stage to get where you want to be. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. How long was that process? Do you think it took you to get comfortable? I had been producing like maybe a year before that, before I went to that school. Okay. Um, in GarageBand and stuff like that. Mm. And once I went to that school, it it's just like expedited it. 
Okay. You know? Yeah. So after that school was over and after you kind of started becoming comfortable in Ableton, what were like the next steps for you? What, what transcended after that? Honestly, bro, just a lot of trial and error. Just doing, me and Van had um, put together a couple parties actually. Okay. DJing parties. We had a party called All That. And then we had a party called Cuffing Season. So which is, yeah, still going on right yeah, now. Yeah, and, and we put that, it's funny because Van was like, yo, we need another, another name for a party. Like, what should we call it? And I was like, and it was at winter time. I was like, why don't we call it Cuffing Season? Perfect. And he's like, what's Cuffing Season? And he Googled it and I was like, bro, Come on. <laughs> I was like, yeah. I know you've been cuffed, bro. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. So when, what year was that when Cuffing that, Season first um, came? That was probably 2017. 2017. 2017 wow okay i didn't know it was has been around that long yeah that's crazy yeah i've seen it and I, to see where it's at now shout out to van yeah and you for like what's going on because now you guys tour well, you guys bro, that's are, all him now bro. really all yeah, him now bro. that's all him he's he's really he's really doing the thing with that yeah man. he's taking it and yeah. like it's cool that he's like having these big acts on that are like from yeah, bro. Lloyd. The cold, lloyd yeah crazy like bro. big ass artists like that it's cool yeah. to see yeah that's my Kuya, bro. Yeah, Shout is it Kuya? <laughs> Shout out to Van. Yeah. What is Kuya for people that are listening and don't know? It means, I think it means cousin. I mean, I'm not, look, I'm not Filipino. <laughs> I'm Filipino adjacent, but I think it's it's cousin, I think, or yeah. brother, right? Endearment. I think something like that, term of endearment. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. That's cool, man. So when did you start to like really indulge yourself in this circle that you, you're a part of now in this like community that you're in? When did you start to like, you know, network with people? And also I want you to touch on like the aspect of like networking and relationship building and how that could kind of help your own career trajectory. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I really, I started back then, you know, and in 2017 or 2016, 2017, when I was going to the school, um, you know, I just looked for like-minded people and, and wanted to kind of push the same thing and grow together. You know what I mean? It's like, and like teamwork in sports, you know, you, you get further as a team. And so yeah. you find people that like the same things as you, whether it's an artist, whether it's a producer, DJ, and then you, you get together and you, you make something and you watch it grow. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you guys grow together. And so, yeah, I, I mean, really... I had been doing it since 2016, since I got here. You know, I'd be going, I'd be going to all the events. I'd be going to all the shows by myself. Bro. By yourself, bro. I went to, I went to Tokyo Beat so many times by myself. <laughs> Have you been to Tokyo Beat? No, I haven't. There was but a I've heard party. Of it. There was a party there, bro. I watched J. Rob's first performance there. Oh no way! He must have been a young buck because he's still really young, but bro, he was a young buck, bro. I went there. It was like it was called like Beats and Ramen or something. Like Beats that. and Ramen. There wow. was like five people there. So would you say back then you were kind of just like exposing yourself to the scene and being mm -hmm. more like observant and just mm -hmm. like really feeling it out? Yeah, man. I was obsessed with the scene. Like I, not the scene, like that sounds like so Hollywood, but like, yeah, I was obsessed with like music and mm -hmm. I was obsessed with these producers. I remember I, w I watched, um, uh, Mac Ayers. I yeah. went to a show after me and my girl broke up from like girl from like 10 years. Oh, no way. I went to you a went show for and 10 I, years? Yeah, the oh, one that I moved out here with. Yeah. Wow. And so I went to a show, bro. I cried by myself, like watching it. I was like, this is no beautiful. Way. I love this. I, I want to come to more stuff, you know? So I would go to, I would go to all, like I said, Tokyo Beat. I go to all the shows, all the selection shows. Like my friend at the time, Audrey, was um, working with Andre Power. Oh, so, wow. Okay. Um, so I'd met him at the time and like we weren't really close. It was it wasn't really till 2019 that I really got close with him. I really got to know him as a person. It was like, yo, you know, he, he, I align a lot with him, with him, like mm -hmm. and how he acts, how he conducts himself. Um, and I was a fan of his. You know what I mean? And it was just cool to be a friend as well. Yeah, know? yeah, yeah. And so like developing these relationships with these people because I think it's it's important to be cognizant of the fact that these were like genuine relationships that you were making and like you had good intentions and like. Things like that, I feel like when you come with a base of like good intentions, it allows for like a space of things to happen for you. You know what I mean? Because yeah. in today's world, and especially in LA, as I'm sure you probably aware of, like the way people move sometimes can be very like transactional, or yeah. they could almost be like off of a, the strength of like bad intentions or just mm -hmm. you know trying to use one of another. So having that base of just like genuine rela relationship and friendship, I think is is like a big like a testament to it would you agree oh 100 percent. i think every relationship that you have you should go into that relationship not trying to get anything out but to extend yourself and be like how can i be 
an asset to you as a friend because mm-hmm. that's what friends are for yeah you know what i'm saying and and if i look at all my friends ricky adrian sophie shots out all these people mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying like even andre they've all we've all helped each other in some regard you know what i mean it's never take 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 let me know who you know you know what i'm saying yeah it's never that it's always like how can we help each other you know what i mean yeah like really community yeah and, and, that, and i feel like that's what's so cool about la right now post pandemic you know mm-hmm. what i'm saying you have these communities that are all getting built from you know we were inside now we're outside we outside we outside we got all these parties coming up all these like you look at pangea and what that is andre's the link up you look at like the art community aj yeah. and like calvin and like all these people and like it, etienne and walk good walk good the health like everybody I, and the way i look at it it's like a black renaissance not a black renaissance but like a renaissance because it is yeah yeah it's like a no no and it's you bring up a good point because it's it's dope to see that all of these different niches are intertwining with similar cultures mm-hmm. like if you're one to really jive with like what Andre has going on with like the link up or Etienne's walk good or even clothing brands like KOI. It's like, you're like, if you like one of these things, you're probably like going to relate to one of these other communities that are in the same industry. Right. And they're all pushing the same agenda, which is community. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and like love, you look at Etienne's walk good love. You look at kids of immigrant love Love. day. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Even like, um, Ari Hall, like, all of them, everybody's like community, community. Like we're building each other up. You know, we were, there was a time where we didn't get to be around each other. Yeah. For two years, two, three years, you know what I'm saying? And now here we are People together. kinda crave it, right? Mm-hmm. And it's really dope to see, man. And like, I, it's, I funny, it's funny cause I had a similar conversation like this with Wella mm-hmm. from uh, KOI. And we were just talking about how like, their brand and how so many brands now are centered around the theme of love and how mm-hmm. they're like championing that kind of phrase. Where is I feel like, or we talked about how like before is just some people were kind of like too cool to like champion like lo- or, like love like yeah, you yeah, know it's bro, like yeah. but now it's like love is cool it's crazy like, it's so funny because like I've always told my boys like I love them and they've yeah. always like been like uh, well, I love you too you know what I mean mm-hmm. but like now I see them and I don't know if it's because of the the culture the community or, or how society is now but now they're really saying it back you yeah. know what I'm saying and I'm like man. Yeah, you sh- I remember when you wouldn't say that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you strike me as a dude that's like in touch with his emotions yeah. and very like heartfelt wears his heart on the shoulder. Would you yeah. agree? Yeah, hundred percent, man. Hundred percent. I was raised by like women too, you know. I oh, feel yeah? like that. I feel like my mom, my grandma, my nonna, she they raised me, you know. Because your saying? father did pass away when you were so young. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like have you always kind of felt like very comfortable around women and just yeah, that's what that, you that's why I have so many um friends of female friend, mm-hmm. you know, um, Sophie, Audrey, I don't know if you know Audrey Wentz, but she's like one of my closest friends, grew up around the corner from me. In oh, Oregon. wow. Is she out here now? She's out here. She's incredible. She's one of the, the sweetest, nicest people you've ever met. She used to work with Andre, and that's how I originally met Andre. And now she's like tapped in with, I mean, everybody that I know, she knows. Yeah. <laughs> everybody she knows, I, I'm starting to know because she knows everybody. Oh, but, really? Yeah, she's one of the sweetest people. And like, yeah, it, it's just her, Sophie, and my, my manager, Brittany, um, okay. who, who runs the party Citrus Room. Yeah, so I, I've noticed that. What is the Citrus Room, and what is that? So it started in Seattle. Um, I would played football with one of her buddies, and he had he had been like, hey, will you listen to my friend Gianni's mix and like it So on SoundCloud? And she was like, sure. She listened to it, started an event series called Citrus Room, and also a podcast, and then had me come up to Seattle to do the first one. And she was living up there at the time. That's where she's from. Um, I went up there. The first one was like 50 people. Oh, really? Yeah. And then fast forward to now, I mean, Citrus Room in Seattle, there's like six. They, they do it at Q Night Club, which is like the biggest. I, I'm de- yeah, I'm definitely aware of Q Night Club. Yeah. So 600 people, like, wow. always sold out. So it's kind of like, is that where it's like kind of home bases? Mm-hmm. That's where Seattle? it started. And then when uh, Brittany moved down here, she gave it about a year. And then she started throwing um, Citrus Room LA. Um, maybe two years ago. Okay. And so I've been helping her with that and we've been kind of growing it together and it's pretty cool. We've got a lot of cool DJs on there now. Yeah, I've seen it. I've seen you guys do some shows at Lock and Key. Yeah, Lock and Key. That's the spot we have right now and yeah, man, it's it's pretty cool to see the community grow and um, yeah, there's uh, two other people involved in Seattle, G-Lo and Han. 
um, both DJs that are holding it down in Seattle right now. Tight. Um, for, citrus. for the residencies out there? Yeah. So what, what would you say Citrus Room is? Is it more of like a collective or is it more of a kind of an event? It's an event, it's an event series. Um, okay. But really, I, when I think of Citrus Room, I think of Brittany, my manager. Really? Because she, she really puts a lot of herself into it. And it's um, the community that she's built is, is just like we talked about, like very loving, um, very loving community and, and people love her and people love the party. So that's dope, man. I'm gonna have to get her on this show one day. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Talk to her. Yeah. And it's dope, man. Like to think back on what you were saying about just how things have transpired from like pre pandemic to post pandemic. Mm -hmm. I never really thought about that. Like people have come out of this like a different person and like are more like the world is in a very state like it's very in stable place right now, but at mm -hmm. the same time, there are like positives, like you said, that have come yeah. out of it, which is dope to see. Yeah, man, it's been really cool. It's been really, it's like the perfect storm, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, exactly. For, for, especially for entertainment, for arts, you know? Mm -hmm. They say the, the best art comes from the worst situations. You that know is I mean? true, that's a great, that's a bar. Yeah. Would you say that you kind of contribute towards this type of like upbringing through your like sets? And I ask this because I've been to like some events where you were DJing before and I feel like your sets are like, they just feel like good times to me. You know what I mm -hmm. mean? Like your track list or your set list are just like music that's more like uplifting and more like, like yeah. I'm just, I'm gonna have a good time if Gianni's like on the ones and twos. You yeah. know what I mean? No, absolutely. I mean, I, it's just a testament to the people that I looked up to, you know? Um, a lot of the music I listened to, like what was played in the house like oldies, you know what I'm saying? R&B, like I'm a huge R&B guy. I wish I could play more R&B. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I love R&B. Is that your favorite genre? Yeah, for sure. By far? By far, yeah. Why is that? I just feel like, and, and going back to the, to the subject of love, back in the day especially, like you really could, like they really painted a picture about love and music mm -hmm. and R&B, you know what they I mean? They did, yeah. And so, and like the beats, I love the beats, I love the lyrics, I love everything about it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Even the dancing that they had, like it was cool. Like army was cool as genre. That you is know? true, there was like a whole kind of like visual that went along with R&B, mm -hmm. whether it was just like, you know, very romantic, dancing in the rain, yeah. like, like that whole thing. Yeah, it was like a vibe, like you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, I, I think, and then also with the SoundCloud era, like how accessible, these people used to became, you know what I mean? How the music, like the genre bending, the genre blending, you know? Like I look at genres like like races. Oh yeah. You know, because people people would categorize, oh that's hip hop, oh that's this, oh that's that. But like you look at selection, like everything's the same. Like they just play music. Yeah. You know what I'm they're, saying? They're not like confined to some type of like genre. Mm -hmm. They just kind of play like sounds that yeah, I like, oh, you're them. this, you have to listen to this. I don't listen to that type of music. Like, I've heard so many people be like, yo, I don't listen to house music because I only listen to hip hop, or I don't listen to Afrobeats, I only listen to hip hop. When you look at Drake, and like all Drake's albums have influence of like dance hall, Afro, you know what I mean? Yeah. House, like all these different genres, they're just categorizing it as hip hop because it's Drake. Yeah, it's true. And I think nowadays people's ears are more diverse because mm -hmm. I feel like back before like this whole wave of SoundCloud happened, it'd take a long time for like a certain genre to have its run. Like mm -hmm. genres would be, would be on like a run for a long time and it'd take a long time until another genre kind of took over, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? But yeah. now it feels like, oh, like, like, like you said, house has kind of been coming big, dance hall's been coming big, like Afrobeat's been coming big and it's like, so many different things are like starting to pop up and it's yeah. cool to see that people are being receptive to it you know yeah yeah and i i think like you, you gotta look at like selection in places like that are really pushing all these genres and be like yo tip your hat to them 100 like, percent. you know what I'm yeah because that's people like that are really the ones who are, are championing it yeah 100 you know? joe k andre power mm -hmm. the whole team over there yeah. like really doing some amazing things and it seems like they're just not slowing down anytime soon bro like they just have continued since like what 2011 12 to just go on this tear that has just continued to i just don't understand how they continue to just find these new sounds and like it's, amazing, it's crazy. <laughs> it's amazing. But you know what? A lot of it's through the travel that they're doing. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Being, being around. I, I mean, I'm not, like I said, I'm not in that world. Mm -hmm. But 
I see them and I'm friends with them and I'm like, I, I understand how, you know what I mean? How they're, how they're inspired by these places that they go to. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So you, you've, you've been to quite a few places yourself, right? Whether it's living in the places that you've lived in or whether it's you traveling to a lot of like foreign countries as well. So yeah. talk about the importance of traveling and living in different places and how that kind of forms you into like the man you are today. Yeah. I think there's no better teacher than going somewhere and learning about something firsthand. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like the best lessons that I've learned are when I'm backpacking in Thailand, when I'm like in Italy, you know, yeah. by myself, when I'm in Colombia, like all these places, I learn about people that I would, I, there's no book that could tell me that. Like there's, there's books obviously that tell you that, but like learning per, like firsthand is just instant insane, man. Yeah, you know? actually like indulging yourself in that yeah, culture. Yeah, like diving into a culture by eating their food, by like seeing how they are, being around locals, you know what I mean? Getting lost, mm -hmm. it's just like, it's unlike anything. What are know? some of the, the places that you've been? Um, I've been to Thailand, I've been to Japan, um, all over Europe, I've been to South America, Colombia, uh, everywhere, dude, really yeah. everywhere. What were some, like do you have any like kind of standout experiences from like any of those trips? Yeah, dude, I went, um, Right after college, I did backpacking in Thailand with my roommate Malachi. Dude, crazy. Really? We what did like this it? trek. Uh, we did all over. We did all over Thailand, um, but we did this trek, this jungle trek, where we stayed with the tribe, like hiked in the mountains, like ten miles. Wow. Stayed with them. Took elephants down. Like it was crazy. Wow. Yeah. So that's one of your like highlights. Yeah, highlights and lowlights because I would never hike in the jungle again. Really? Like it wasn't. It wasn't like a hike. Like it wasn't like Runyon. Like we went in to the jungle with a dude with a machete that oh, we found shit. on Google. Oh my gosh! Yeah, no like path, nothing. <laughs> so one of those just in there cutting, cutting shit. <laughs> one of those things that like you're happy you experienced it, but it's yeah. like it's cool doing one time or not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll do everything once. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I feel you. Yeah, yeah nothing I'll wrong do with that. Once, <laughs> what What are some places that music's brought you? Whether that's um, like domestically or. So, uh, for the first time, I played. This year has been a really good year for me because I, for for especially for DJing, I played in Europe for the first time. Oh wow! Um, I played in London with Andre. Oh, Bruce you did? Up, yeah, which was insane, man. Insane experience. I, I just can't thank him enough for bringing me and having me experience that with him. Yeah. Um, I played Toronto, which was another unique experience, similar to to London because of this the the influence that they have with like the islands in Jamaica. Yeah. And, you know what I'm saying? It was really cool. I've heard that the crowds out there too are like a different type of... Dude, just like so receptive. And, and that's the thing that I love about playing music because I feel like a lot of times DJs, we get so boxed in, you know, at these places. Mm -hmm. It's like, I know that when I go to this spot, I'm gonna have to play this because if not, they're not gonna really vibe with yeah. it. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. And so being able to just kind of pick anything and play it. It's such a cool experience. Yeah, because you just know that they're gonna be open minded to mm -hmm. what you're gonna play. Yeah. Rather than just like yeah. sticking to and one And dance sound. to it and realize that it's music. You know what I mean? And not be like too elite to like dance. And mm -hmm. then that helps you be freer as a DJ, right? Mm -hmm. You're able to spin what you want and it's like you're in it, you're into it way more than just kinda like playing one sound the whole night, right? Yeah, man. It's like like vibing off the energy. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's it's that's so crucial. Yeah. And in Toronto, like that was the first time I really experienced that. We're like, they're like in your face, like we love this. You know what I mean? Turn like run that back. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. The feeding off your energy. Yeah. So hell yeah. Really cool. So would you? What would you say is like one of your strong? If you could say this about yourself, what is one of your strong suits with DJing? Um, that's tough, man. I haven't I haven't ever really thought about that. Um, probably just playing multiple genres. I never like just play. For instance, I never just play hip hop, or I never just play like UKG. Like it's it's always like all of it. Okay. I want to give you like a sample platter. Yeah. You know what okay. I mean? Like a little, a little bit, bit of everything. Of everything okay. And see what you vibe to, and and kind of like playing old with the new, playing songs that you can sing to, but also playing songs that you're like, oh, I like this. I want to hear it again. What is this? Yeah, I feel like as an audience member, you can appreciate that too, because mm -hmm. if you're mixing in so many different sounds, it's likely that you know one of the audience or one of the crowd members is gonna like 
like mm-hmm. one of those genres and then they may get put onto a genre at the show that they may not have known about yeah. and then pulling out their Shazam and just like what is this yeah, and then they got a new this, right? <laughs> but you can't get this on SoundCloud yeah, it is true man. Yeah. SoundCloud means a Shazam bro I know I feel really like does. some type of thing like that it really does but yeah no I think that like picking you know picking multiple genres or just like bringing energy you know what I mean bringing mm-hmm. like being happy I feel like so many times people go into these spaces and they're so serious and it's like everybody's trying to be so cool but it's like dude I'm a goofy ass dude you know what yeah. I'm saying like I just want to dance and like hang out with my friends you know what I mean <laughs> which That's is what all. you what you do at the end of the day yeah I'm cracking jokes I'm like telling dad jokes and like dancing you know what I mean <laughs> like that's what we do so yeah, yeah. it kind of speaks to what I was saying earlier you know what I mean like to the couple of like sets that I've seen you play mm-hmm. it's just like you have that good energy and you can kind of feed off of that and the room kind of just is more like attuned to dancing especially in LA it's kind of like you were saying like some people are too cool and like I don't get my yeah, shoes man. stepped on like you know yeah, what I mean? we, but we getting out of that yeah yeah yeah, yeah we getting out of that I feel like there's some there's some parties where people are really starting to dance you know what I'm the saying? link up the link up yeah Angea, mm-hmm. even citrus room man like yeah cuffing season all these things, man. Yeah, very much, very true. Like cuffing season kind of reminds me of like one, four, three, two, yeah. where like, people just go to dance. Like, yeah, man. And th- and those are parties that I would go to, bro. When I first moved here, I would wait in that line. You would wait in that line, dude. I would wait in that line. I would. The one, four, three line was crazy, Dog, bro. <laughs> two hours, three hours, bro, but worth it. I'd pack a lunch when I go. <laughs> bro, you bet the pregame starts when you're in line, bro. basically. <laughs> Honestly, bro, I remember I. I remember that it was like one time it was so long that it was like you had to like wait to cross the street and the the line was on the other side like of the you know what I mean was it at, was it at the Echo but when was at the Echo or when, the Echo Plex Los Globos Echo Plex right yeah, yeah, yeah Echo yeah, Plex yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I remember those days bro I was there too that was also the first time I got one of those dog those street dogs oh really you got put on that during that time yeah. bro took an L took an L took an L <laughs> that shit will fuck your stomach up that's exactly what <laughs> pretty bad yeah, yeah. but it tastes so good at the time God, what? I, I, oh, it smells so good it yeah. always sounds good They're, they get you bro they, they get clank you. your the, the metal thing on the I'm like of course I want this five dollars of course bro yeah. and I was eight you know it's eight dollars now inflation bro I know <laughs> hey let them get get it how they live man I, that's what I'm saying man hey I'm not mad at him. Yeah, it is, I'm not mad at him at all either. But no, it's cool, bro. It's cool to be seeing all these different brands pop up and all these events kind of like simultaneously happening. And right now there's such an appetite for it because mm-hmm. everybody's just kind of like, I feel like trying to catch up on like everything that they missed. Mm-hmm. And also I feel like there's enough room out here for everybody to eat. You know yeah. what I mean? It's not like a competition thing where, you know, certain like events or certain like collectives can only succeed and some can't. It's like, there's enough room for everybody to be able to have their own pocket, but it's important also to not really, you know, copy one of another, right? It's yeah. like, important to come well, with something the original. Thing. That's the thing that's really hard right now, especially with how many parties there are. Yeah. Like, dude, there's so many parties, like it is exhausting. It is exhausting, Like bro. I would post every week on my TikTok, I would post like the parties of the week. And like now it's gotten to a point where I can't even keep track of <laughs> Like go where you want to, go where your heart desires. <laughs> At this point, you know yeah. Just like go to a place that you went before, there's probably a party going there. Yeah, you know you're only saying? one man. Yeah. You or just wait this weekend and go the next week. Gonna be, you know what I mean? This yeah. Be so it becomes hard too, like when you're having so many homies do it, like you want to support them, but like you got at a point, at some point you got everybody doing something and you're like, bro, if you're like me and you can never say no. Oh yeah. Bro, I'm pulling up to I'm pulling up to five minutes of my homie set, going to the next homie set, pulling hey. up to five minutes of that, going to yoga, going to walk good, pulling up to, <laughs> bro. Hey, you're a real one then. You're a real supporter. Yeah, bro. I, one thing I'm going to do, I'm going to support the homies. That's one thing I'm going to do. That's what's up, man. Yeah. Is that important to you? Like, Yeah, man. I know, how, I know what it's like to put yourself out there and be like, hey, this is what I'm doing. Come support me. And nobody show up. Oh, uh, yeah. So I, I, I never want anybody to feel that. None of my homies, nobody that I know. You know what I mean? So I'll always support. I'll always, if somebody puts up a link, like, yo, I'm selling hats, like, I'm buying the hat. That's why I bought this. Like, yeah, you know what I'm you, that's very true, man. You are always supporting the homies, whether it's the brand. Yeah, like, you name. You're here. All my gear, bro, that. pretty much. All my gear is, is pretty much the homies. Really? Stuff, you know what I mean? Yeah, so. That's what's up, man. There's a, sp- there's a special place in heaven for people like you. 
Yeah, always hopefully, supporting. Hopefully I make it there, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you're gonna make it there. Yeah, Basically, okay. the way you're supporting people, and that's appreciated, bro. Like as somebody who, like yourself, like likes to get that support from people, it's important to you know give that to others. If give what you receive, you know what yeah. I mean. At yeah, the end of the day, it's important, man. It's important to give and not expect anything as well. You know what I'm saying? I feel mm -hmm. like some sometimes people give because they're expecting something back. Yeah, but I feel like that cancels it out. That's very true. You know what I'm saying? Don't count favors. Yeah, don't count favors, man. Because if I counted favors, like <laughs> you be in debt. <laughs> yeah, I be in debt, bro. You know what I'm saying? Like so many people have helped helped me out. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So, um, yeah, bro. Yeah, absolutely. So something you just touched on right now is TikTok. And I wanted to talk about this because I love your content that you have on your socials, whether it's IG or whether it's your TikTok. I peeped your TikTok as well. So talk about like the importance of that in today's day and age, like really being able to market yourself and being able to just connect with people through social media and like... How did you get good at it, basically? Bro, honestly, I'm not good at it. Like, you don't think so? Uh, I don't know. I think that I just, I just peeped what I, I just saw what, I just posted stuff and saw what worked and was like, okay, I'm gonna do more of this. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? It's really just the algorithm telling me what I need to do. Yeah, that's you know true. What I'm saying? Yeah. So you're studying it kind of in a sense. Yeah, yeah. I've always been um, interested in that, um, but I think that with TikTok for me, like, I was just posting stuff that I liked. You know what I mean? And like mm -hmm. events that I was going to. And then eventually like one of them popped off and then I got a whole bunch of followers and I was like, oh shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh huh. And so from there I just like kind of kept doing it. It's interesting though because like you think that you're posting what you're supposed to post and then all of a sudden like you get like three views and you're like, bro, <laughs> what? Yeah, no, it's really tricky, right? Cause like you could take, like you think you have the formula mm -hmm. and then you, then you like use it and it's just like it didn't work. Like, what? Yeah, yeah, what do you mean? Like I had like brands like, and it's funny because it's always the paid content. Like I had brands come to me and be like, yo, like I like your content. Can we pay you to put this artist's song on it? And it's it's funny because that's the worst video I have. Really? Yeah, that's the one that does the worst. Did you put like paid, paid promotion and stuff? No, that's I, crazy. I would never put that because I don't want people to be like. Yeah, like yeah. you're selling them something yeah, or yeah, something yeah. like that. I feel yeah. you. So I don't know, maybe it just was off brand and people knew that it was unauthentic. unauthentic. Yeah, but but yeah, no, it's it's interesting, man. I, I feel like you need it to, especially as a DJ, because really what we're selling nowadays is is our personality. Mm -hmm. There's so many DJs that are good. That's very true. And it goes back to like football, bro. When I was when I was playing, I had a coach tell me when I was going to you know doing my my little dash at the league. I had I had a coach tell me he's like, there's gonna be people here that you're better than but there's also gonna be people that are better than you that aren't where you're at. So you take advantage of your situation. Ah, that's a really good point. You know and it I'm kind saying? of applies to... It applies to this too, bro. There's so many good, D better DJs than me, you know? Yeah. And so many. And there's so many DJs that you're better than too that are, are, are like higher places because of how they market themselves, market right? Market themselves. And, what, and at the end of the day, it's like if you can build a following and people like you, who's to say, who's better than who you know what I mean yeah no like true shit bro because when I I told you off camera but I worked for Insomniac mm -hmm. and while I was there like obviously I was very involved in like the, the booking of artists at, at some shows you know what I mean and mm -hmm. like understood how that whole process worked and some of these promoters and like festival um talent bookers like one of the main components that they look at is literally like some of the followings that you have Bro, on every, your social media account. Some some artists that have been booked for festivals, some of these major festivals are literally off the strength of their following. Like yeah. their musical catalog, irrelevant. They're just like, can you sell tickets? Bro, Fuck that's, if you're good. But that's, what, <laughs> but that's what it's come down to, right? Mm -hmm. Like you look at labels doing that same thing. That's very true. It's like, <laughs> you, have a, you have how many followers? All right, but... Like, we'll sign you. But at that point, it's like knowing, I have this many followers, they're gonna sign me for this. Why do they want me? I have the power. That's true. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's like, for artists, if you especially- look at it that way. Especially independent artists, bro, it's like, how I look at social media is like, I had, that's an opportunity to build myself, to build my value. Yeah, you it know? is. Cause like, for so many years, even, bro, I was just like a DJ that was like, just playing shows that like, of my friends. You know what I mean? And this year really, and I don't know if it's because of TikTok and because I got some followers on TikTok now or what, but like now I'm getting booked, 
book bookings that like I dreamed of. Having. It's like momentum. Yeah, it's like momentum. And it's like, thank, I'm thankful for the followings that I got because it kind of like leg- legitimizes you, kind of. You know what it, I'm saying? No, it does. It's like it's a cosign. Like, it's like this should never be it. Like I felt like back then I could. I'm. I was a better DJ. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. But now, since I have a little bit more followers, a little bit more traction, like maybe that's why I'm getting more bookings. You know what I mean? Yeah, but, it's like the game we're playing now. You know? Yeah, it sucks, but I understand it. And it's like if that's the case, then do everything you can to build that. Yeah, and I think going back to like the whole content thing, it's dope to hear that like everything you're posting is just like what you like, and mm-hmm. people are resonating with it because, yeah. like you said, people can sense the organic and the like and the realness of it. So it's like if you're not trying to force something that you're not, then I don't see an issue with like posting whatever you're posting. And also I think one of the good things is like you're very consistent in what you do, you know what I mean? And people love consistency, so they're gonna come back for more. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see, man. Look, it's been slow lately. (laughs) It's been slow lately. Bro, I've been like, dog, do y'all still like me? Like, do I have, (laughs) you know, like. The algorithm kind of. Do I have to change up? (laughs) (laughs) Throwing on a a new Gianni. Yeah, bro, I'll be. Nah, and it's something to be said about that, bro. And it's something I've thought about, too, is just like, you know, so many times I feel like people are told, like, you know, just keep your head down and grind and keep doing what you're doing and things will happen for you, which I believe is true to a certain extent. But to another extent, it's like, well, what if you're, what you're doing consistently isn't the right way to do it and that's why you're not succeeding, you know what yeah. I mean? So like, when, when do you find a way to like do something different and look at yourself and be like, this doesn't work versus just like being consistent and like, you know, something's gonna happen for you. It's kind of hard to like, coming from like somebody who's trying to trying to make it and what they're doing it's kind of hard to like distinguish that you know yeah. i you know it's it's interesting cuz there's no right or wrong answer in yeah. my opinion you know like some people are like post 5 times a day like post 5 times a day i don't even eat 5 times a day like how am i supposed to come up with content bro Facts. content yeah. it's exhausting bro to think about even like just posting events bro i get stressed out yeah. i'm like Dang, I have to post this. Then I have to think about the song. Then I have to think about the events. Then I have to think about if people are actually gonna resonate with it. Yeah, it is. You know, and it's like, bro. Then there's other people who are like not posting five times a day. They're posting once a day, and they're getting like crazy views. You know what I mean? Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Who's to know what? The- <laughs> it's it's hard to be independent these days, but at the same time, being independent is very like much more lucrative than it used to be. Yeah. Well, I think, I think that, bro, people, like, some of my homies that are independent artists are, like, don't have TikToks or whatever. And they're like, yo, like, I see you posting TikToks now. Like, I'm thinking about doing it. I'm like, why not? What's it, what's it going to hurt? Yeah. Worst case scenario, you don't get, like, I was doing. You don't get anybody. Being, you know what's funny? Sophia, or Sophie. Yeah. I was, we were having Thanksgiving dinner at um, Andre's house, like, last year. And... <laughs> It's funny because this happened. She was like, yo, you post dope stuff, but like, it's cute that like two people comment on it and like oh, she's- <laughs> 13 people view it. She was like, it's cute. You have your like two little followers. And then like after that, I had a video that did like a whole bunch of views, but it was just funny because that's how fast it can happen. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, that is it true. It was like, I think it was like the next week I had a video that got like a hundred and something. You know that's what I mean? funny. Yeah, because it's, it's, I kind of like have this picture in my head. I'm not sure if you've seen that, like, not that meme, but that like inspirational, like, um, With picture. The, the, the yeah, axe, yeah, yeah, when yeah, it's just like the guy going. turns around and he was literally like one more hit away from hitting the, the diamond. Yeah. You know what I mean? Exactly, bro. Exactly. Yeah. But who's to say what's, 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 you know, what's right and what's wrong, what's good to do and what's not good to do. You know, you can just study the people that you have similar interests as and, or want to inspire, inspire to be and do what they're, like, try to do what they're doing. But Very their true. story is not your story. That's another thing, too. It's like what works for them may not work for you because mm-hmm. you have a completely different journey, right? Right, right. And that's, I mean, that's something we both probably know from, from sports. It's like you see all these dudes and you're like, man, I know I'm better than them. Yeah. But then at the end of the day... It was a realization for me. It's like, bro, that's not my journey. That's their journey. Mm-hmm. I can't, I can't live their life because they're living their life. 
yeah. you know, what's supposed to be for them is for them. You know what I mean? What's for, supposed to be for me is for me. And it may not, it might not be this. You know what I mean? Yeah. And did you, did you have to realize that through like experiencing it or is this yeah, like no. through getting cut through getting told I'm not good enough? You know what I mean? Like that's See what I mean? Really- like you're battle tested. You know what I mean? It doesn't necessarily have to be like a football thing or like a sports thing. If you're listening to this, it's like, I know that it may be hard to just seem like, oh, they're just talking about football and it's like, it's kind of like only relatable to that, but it's not. It's like, it's it's subjective to anything that you're doing in life, right? Mm-hmm. Like whether you're, you were um, in the army in your past life, whether you came from like an abusive relationship, whether you came from like a broken home or just like whatever it is, like when you go through these things, it kind of like battle tests you. When you come out of it, I feel like a lot of the people, a lot of people who are successful, like had a, had like very hard triumphs, you know yeah. what I mean? That they went through before they got to where they're at now. Yeah, man, and I, it's it's, I hate when people say like, I got here, I'm self-made, you know what I'm saying? I hate that, I hate that expression because there's so much help along the way, whether it's help with experiences or people that are in your life that help guide you, bro. There's so many things that have come into my life that have made me realize what my purpose is supposed to be or redirect my purpose. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Whether it's in relationships and, and girls that I thought I was supposed to be with, yeah. jobs, music, sports, whatever, dreams. Like, it's all put things into perspective, every failure that I've had. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? So. Yeah, and you're somebody that, like, throughout this whole episode even, you've kind of given flowers to anybody who's, who's helped you in your come up. You know what I mean? So you're mm-hmm. not just saying that. Like, you're actually living that. Like, yeah, you're, you're no, like, yeah. giving props to people who have actually, like, giving you a helping hand like throughout yeah, this bro, shit. so many people have given me a helping hand and like yeah i i don't even have enough time to talk about it you know what i'm <laughs> saying like it's just anybody who's even like bro i i i've always been like very high energy yeah but like always really shy when you first meet not super shy people are like bro you're not shy but mm-hmm. i've had like a little bit i've been a little bit reserved sometimes because i don't want to offend people and i want people to know that i'm authentic and i'm not coming to them for anything, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, I don't I see need what you mean. From you. Um, not that there's not. It's not that you don't have anything I want, but like there's. I'm, I don't need anything from you. I don't want you to to think I'm coming to this space to take from you. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, yeah, man. Like that's that's just how I live my life. Like always helping my friends, however I can. Helping anybody, however I can. Always, whenever room I'm in, if I know somebody that has a similar interest as you, or an opportunity that you might be able to you know, use, mm-hmm. dog, I'm, I have no problem telling you. Throwing you know a lob mean? up. Yeah, especially if I trust you as a person. Yeah. For sure. That's what it's all about, bro, I love that. And, like, yeah, and everybody saw, needs it. Yeah, bro, I saw a podcast that was talking about um, helping people and giving people opportunities and if you should be paid for those. And the person was like, mm. you shouldn't be paid for being a good person. That's a great, that's a great point. For connecting people and watching something beautiful come out of it. And like, I get it. Like, I get that. I, I, like, resonate with that. Like, there shouldn't be a payment for me helping you achieve your dreams and maybe that person achieve their dreams as well. Yeah, you know bro, saying? absolutely. Also, like, not to gatekeep, like, shit, you know what I mean? There's yeah. a lot of gatekeeping going on. Yeah. It's like, yeah. it's not necessary. <laughs> yeah, no, 100%. 100%. Yeah. And I think this is good for you, man, because it speaks to, like, the organic things of nature of things for you like you just do good and like good things happen you know what I mean like not it's not always the case but like overall I feel like you are just a solid person so people want to be solid back to you and it's not something that you're like necessarily thinking of like oh I'm gonna be solid because I want you to be solid back it's just like that's who you are and it's coming back to you tenfold yeah no and I'm honestly I'm blessed to have the people that I've had in my life too you know like looking at hearing some people's experiences in LA especially and like in the industry and like yeah you know what I'm saying like it makes me think like where are these people at you know what I'm saying yeah like we talk about people talk about it so often and maybe I'm just blind to it (laughs) and it's probably there and there's been and I'll be lying to say that there hasn't been times where I've, I've been like dang bro like this person's just taking everything from me and I have nothing else to give and my energy sucked and like yeah. But like, I don't let that affect me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, it's, and it, I think it goes back to the fact that like, you're not, you're doing things because you have good intentions with it. You know, mm-hmm. people, 
people also often, I feel like, come to LA, just somebody who's been born and raised here, like come to LA for like a certain purpose or goal that they want to achieve. And it makes sense, obviously, because this is a place to like kind of make it happen. Mm -hmm. But if they don't get what they want or they're not like getting it fast enough, I feel like they start to like throw shade or like they get jaded by just the LA experience. And like, that's kind of why they talk bad about it, you know? Yeah, bro, there's so many haters. They're like, yeah, (laughs) they just like aren't living what they thought they were gonna live, the dream that they thought they're gonna live. And so they just throw tomatoes on everything, bro. Mm-hmm. 100%. You know what I'm saying? And so, I mean, you just gotta be, you just gotta be aware of that and, or secure enough in yourself and your own path and your own journey that you're like, look, bro, you'll get to what you need to get to. Yeah. Like, like I'm gonna have my flowers now, but like, you're gonna get your flowers too. You know what I mean? There's no need to hate. Yeah. We all can get our flowers. You exactly. Know what I'm saying? Yeah. Just like, wait. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I feel like that's something that I've learned, too, where I've been in places I was like, man, I'm DJ, I've been DJing for longer than, I mean, s- since I was in sixth grade, bro. Yeah, you know, and I was like time. on turntables first. And then, like, you hear haters talk about, like, oh, if you're on your controller, like, you're not a good real DJ. If you do this, you're not like a CDJs, real DJ. Yeah. You know, and you hear that, and you're like, bro, what? Yeah. <laughs> you're just hating. Yeah, literally. Like, who cares? Like, if people like it. Who cares? Mm-hmm. Yeah, know? exactly. There's like a pocket for for both can win, both can be right. Like yeah, not one has to be. If you want to play, if you want to play songs off an of iPhone, literally, and people okay. mess with you, be the iPhone DJ, bro. Get it how you live, bro. Why am I gonna hate on you? Like, <laughs> thank you, man. Like life's too short to be concerned about like what other people will do. And I feel like this brings up a good point because it's like. It usually if you're doing something and you're like like you know killing it and whatever it is that you're doing and you're like you know well intended and like you have a lot going on for yourself you're usually not really concerned with what somebody else is doing you're yeah, usually bro. like in your own lane like happy i feel like it's like the haterness comes from like people who you know don't have much going on or they're just like they're not focused on their purpose. They're more focused on like watching what everybody's doing. And maybe they got sour from like a certain experience that they had or just things aren't working out how they wanted to. But yeah. usually it's the people that that are doing their thing and like actually like excelling that aren't really paying attention to that whole thing, you know? No, for sure. I will say this. The worst thing is like somebody who is doing their thing who you might've like looked up to who starts hating a little? Really, bro? It's nothing like it, bro. There's that's I don't get before. it, bro. I just I ex- just experienced for the first time, like hate directed towards me oh, on no. Twitter, and I was like, bro, for what? I don't even know this person. What? You know what I'm Did saying? Did you look up to this person, or was it? Like- it, it, it was. It, it was kind of like a. It's not that I looked up to them, but like I respected their art. And okay. I respected their craft, and I was like, oh, this person's cool, and I'd been following them for a while, and then I got and I was like. Dang, that's crazy. Like, you don't even know me. Did they at you? Or is it subtweet? Subtweet, okay. but like also kind of at. Oh, shit. Not like Directed. directly. Okay. But like, yeah. You knew it was for you. 100%. Damn, man. Yeah. So I was like, man, that's crazy. Like, I don't even know. Like, you barely know, know about, you probably just heard about me. You yeah. Know? I, I didn't do anything. I didn't take food off your table or nothing like that. Yeah. Like, what's the point? Man, that hurts. Yeah. What's the point? Yeah. It's not, <laughs> it's not necessary. Yeah. I remember, I think, I, I'm not sure if, I think, you know, Verissa? Yeah. The photographer. Mm-hmm. I think she had said something about this where, like, I won't say who the artist is, but, like, there is this artist that she shot and she's, like, been a huge fan of this artist, like, her entire life. Mm-hmm. And, um, she had like an experience where she she went to the artist to introduce herself. She had been taking pictures of the artist, like artist posted this shit, like, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Goes up to the artist, introduces herself, and he just like looks at her and just like walks away. And it's Bro. just like, you know what I mean? That's the worst part, but that's the ugliest trait. Mm-hmm. You know, like that, that like, I'm too good for you entitlement. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? like. It's the worst, bro. Like, for what reason? Mm-hmm. You're, a, you're a human being. Like yeah. the rest of us. And, like, because people like you and because people probably don't know who you really are and how you really act, like, you have a little bit of clout or whatever. But there's, yeah. no, need, there's no need. Like, we're, we're all the same, dude. Exactly, yeah. And yeah, so, so it's important to you, for you to, like, remember you came from, right? And Yeah, bro. I mean, for me, bro, I feel like I still haven't done anything yet. You know? Like, yeah. this year has been cool. I've been getting some gigs. I've been doing some stuff and traveling. 
meeting some cool people, but like I feel like I haven't done anything. You know what I'm saying? Like compared to some of these people I look up to, like they've changed the game, bro. Well, it's gotta be hard for you, man. Cause like your homies are all doing really cool and big shit. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's gotta be hard for you to not like compare your success to them. Cause yeah. you've done really cool shit too. You yeah. know what I mean? How is it, is it hard for you to kind of like, you know what I mean? I think, I think all I can do, bro, is be a cheerleader. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. Like, I want my I want I want to have my life and, and do well for my family and, and have like a name for myself just like anybody else mm -hmm. you know that does something that they love but I will never it's never going to be hard for me to cheer on my friends what well, very well said you know mm -hmm. it's ne it's, that's never that's never going to be the hardest thing especially like friends doing so many cool things in different industries you know what I mean yeah it's like at the end of the day you want to surround yourself with these people because we're pulling each other up you know, like yeah. we, we talk about like, I'm in a group, the Kuyas is like me, Adrian, Van, and Ricky. All doing amazing stuff too. All of them inspire me, bro. Mm -hmm. You know, like all of them are doing cool shit. It's kind of like being, like if you're kind of translating, I feel like we keep going back to sports, but it's kind of like being on like the USA basketball team. Like, you know what I yeah. mean? Maybe, maybe you're like, I don't know, um, Lame like Lonzo Ball and like you're around like, Kobe Bryant, KD, yeah. you know what I mean? It's like yeah. these people are having such great successes and it makes you wanna like elevate your game more than anything rather than just, you know, yeah. compare. Yeah, yeah, bro, 100%. So, yeah, I think it's been cool to see too because it's like not everybody has been in a place, like a lot of my friends, especially my friends, have been in a position where they weren't handed anything. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and they really came here. A lot of them moved here. A lot of them are transplants, like myself. Yeah. And like really had to work their way up to like make a splash in the scene. You know what I mean? Like not knowing anybody, not having parents who are connecting them. No, we don't, my parents don't know anybody down here. Yeah. My parents think true. it's so cool that I live here. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like my mom wants to be here. Yeah. But all of them doing their own thing and building their own reputation and like, for instance, when I went to the, this thing f with Adrian, bro, like just seeing the community that he brought for his art show, insane. That was the uh, the Reverante studio, or what art show was that? The that was the art show. I don't remember the name of it, but it was the one just recent, like okay. two weeks in ago. LA. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and just like seeing like the impact that he had, and like what he did for his community, bro, for the Filipino mm -hmm. community, insane. Like yeah. those are the things. Those are the stories that need to be told, bro. Yeah. You know, and like talking about the Renaissance era, the black and Renaissance era of this time, mm -hmm. of LA right now. Like, We're people, like people like you, like documenting these things and documenting yeah. these people is like so important, bro, because I don't want people to forget about this. You know? I appreciate that, man. Yeah, yeah I, th I think the same exact thing, bro. Like we're living in a, a time right now that's championing like the black renaissance. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important for people to be able to hear the stories of, of what's going on too. And that's kind of definitely something I'm cognizant of. of mm -hmm. Like when I'm thinking about bringing guests on, like I wanna be able to give these people a platform to express what's happening. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, when I first started this thing, I always thought like, there's not anybody really like documenting or covering like mm -hmm. this whole yeah, this bro. whole process. Like I wanna be able to share these stories. Yeah, you know bro. what I mean? I mean, you even look at like the Ebony Beach Club that Brick was throwing. Yeah. Bro, mm -hmm. that's like monumental. There's 2,000 black people and brown people on the beach surfing, bro. Insane, yeah. Insane. Like the black market flea, like these things are like, it's just, I don't see it happening around the world, bro. It's like, it's like hypersensitive to LA, bro. It you is. You know what I mean? Like it's like a time where LA is like building itself up, you know? Yeah, and what, I, what I've noticed just from like his, like the his, our history is just like things, I feel like originate in Western culture and they make their way inwards. You know what I mean? So I'm interested to see if this whole wave kind of catches on uh later on in like other parts of the u.s but yeah man. i hope it, i hope it does yeah me too I it'd hope be it dope does. to see so with that said what where do you see yourself at like what are some next levels that you kind of want to attain moving forward and um for me man i'm i'm just like really trying to get more into producing um i have a couple projects coming out with a couple artists that okay. i'm excited about um doing more djing i mean this year 
three of my dreams as a DJ happened. Well, I, I, saw you, I saw you on tour with uh, Fabo, right? Yeah, yeah. Insane. That was insane. One of my favorite artists. Oh, really? Yeah, for sure. Crazy. For sure. I, it's funny because I met him at his first album release that Selection did um, for Soulquarius. Oh, and, wow. Yeah, and then just been a fan of his. Been in the studio with him a few times. Um, you know, the homies produced for him and... and yeah, man, we just been real friendly, and it just the opportunity came. I was actually going to Dallas and Houston for his openers, um, Digati and uh, Say, Say Johnny, two incredible R and B artists. Um, and so, yeah, and something happened with his DJ, so he needed me, and I also work full time, man. So, oh I, yeah, so I'm sheesh. I'm trying to balance the man. balance the two, but it's getting hard, man. You yeah, know what I'm I, I can relate, bro. I have a full time job too, yeah. so I, I understand the the grind it takes to be able to put in as much effort as you do into this creative field, and then mm -hmm. also still have some left over for. And it's tough too, man. I, I you can probably like you can probably understand this as well. It's like you don't want to tell people that you work because you don't want them to take away from the validity of you as an artist. Uh huh. One hundred percent. If I tell people, oh, I also work, they're like, I mean, the question I get all the time is like, do you, do you do this full time? And like that, my answer to that is how they're gonna look at me as an artist. It's very true. You know what I'm Why saying? Why do you think it is that way? Because I know exactly what you're saying. Because people look at it as like, can you support yourself? Can you support yourself with your? If you're good enough, you can support yourself. That's the stigma. And I feel like that's I feel like that's why I, I kind of try to separate it. I mean, most of my homies know. Like when I pull up to them, I'm pulling up in a suit, and they're like, "Why are you in a suit?" And now they understand. But like, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Or like at work, my work people are like, "Yo, I'm looking at your Instagram, and you're in Paris. Why are you in Paris? Like, how did you get there? <laughs> and how do you work? You know what I'm saying?" Yeah. To me though, and like I'm interested to hear what you think about it too. It's like I don't see the a problem with like working and having s stability and security and also like working on your your like what you your passion is too like i think we're in a day and age where like having security is important after this pandemic we just went through right. and i understand the side of just like going a hundred percent into like whatever it is that you're doing but i don't see why you can't have a job and support yourself a hundred percent bro when i first moved here and i was like oh, i'm gonna be an artist i'm gonna try to do it and like I realized real fast where, where my priorities were. And it's like, do you wanna be a starving artist? Which is completely fine, mm -hmm. if, that's, if that's the journey you, t you decide to take. Or do you wanna put this, put all the money that you make and put it back in your craft? There we go. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, how do you wanna, and it's also, it's like time management. Like, do you really think you not having a job in those eight hours or whatever do you really think that you're gonna be putting that into your craft or are you gonna be sleeping? You know what I mean? Or yeah. chilling or doing something, whatever. Like if you can really answer that and be like, yeah, I'm gonna put that in the craft, then do, do that. Mm -hmm. Like invest in yourself. I will never tell you not to invest in yourself. But if you feel like it's gonna be more stressful to be at home and be thinking about your rent yeah, than to be, you know what I mean, uh -huh. stable. Like, bro, I remember like, when I was stressed out to buy plugins. Like, oh my gosh. Like for, for producing. When you were trying to do the starving artists. Yeah. Yeah. Method. Or and it wasn't even like I was trying. Like I was just <laughs> I was just working and I wasn't getting paid. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> yeah. but yeah, man, like how do you how do you, you know, manage your time? You yeah, know? it's an interesting conversation. A lot a lot of people for some reason don't talk about it and it's kinda shied away from. But I know what you're saying, bro. Like and it's also perception, I feel like. It's, a, it's, it's also people being like, yo, you're an artist. You're doing this full time. That mm. means that you are serious about it. They're you're projecting not, like that, that ideology onto you. And also projecting their insecurities on you. Like, I can't do, I can't be an, a, an artist. I couldn't do, I could never do that. You know what I mean? Yeah. I have to have stability. So they're like projecting that on you. Like, oh, if I can't do it, you, can't, you do it. can't do it either. Yeah. Mm, that's a good point. I never thought about it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, I don't see an issue. This is the way I see it too. It's like, there, there, if it, there comes a day in time where I'm able to like fully kind of support myself with this, I don't have to be making as much money as I do with this job that I have. But if there comes a time where I can support myself with this, passion I have 
by all means, I'll quit my day job. Like, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I have no problem with that. But until then, like, I don't see the issue with, with making calculated risks and decisions. Cause that's what, the, that's, what the, that's what it is at the end of the day. Like you're making a calculated decision on when it's time for you to actually quit. Because I've, man, I've talked to so many people on this show and interviewed so many people that, you know, had that tipping point happen. Like they were working that day job and then they finally got to that point where Mm-hmm. They no longer needed that job. You know what I mean? So yeah. there's stories out there to be told of like having a day job and doing your passion until your your passion takes over. Like there's plenty of, of stories where it's happened. Yeah, I mean, it's, and like I said, like it's tough, man. Like I, I feel like that I'm at that tipping point every day, bro. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like if you think about it, we're working nine to five or whatever our, our hours are. You know what I'm saying? And then the weekend's supposed to be the time that we are relaxing from that. But you know, I'm DJing Thursday, I'm DJing yeah. Friday, I'm DJing Saturday, sometimes Sunday, bro. And it's like, that's a whole nother work week. And you're supporting the homies. Yeah. <laughs> well, the homies, I've been kind of taking a break from the okay. homies. <laughs> the <laughs> no, kids been playing. picking up. <laughs> I'm, I'm playing. I'm, I'll support, but yeah. But you know what I mean? Like, that's a, whole t- that's a whole nother job, like, after work, bro. Yeah. You know, so it's like. It's, it's hard, man. It's got to be taking a toll on you, too, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. My back's messed up, bro. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to physical therapy oh, twice man. a week. You're starting to feel the old injuries, bro. Yeah, I, bro, I feel every hit, bro. I <laughs> literally started physical therapy today. I've been going to the chiropractor three times a week, bro. Like, bro, same here. Like, it's crazy because some of the games you'd play, it's like you're kind of held together by tape and shit, and like now you're starting to feel it, bro. <laughs> the cortisone shots, man. The rotator cuffs, man. You've been through. The, you've been through the. We did the dash, bro. We did the dash. <laughs> totally. And then I think another aspect, too, to this, since we're on this subject, is, like, what about everything else in life, right? Like, you have, I've seen you have a girlfriend as well. Mm-hmm. So it's, like, how do, you, how do you find time to balance all of these different, different, like, sides of your life? You know what I mean? You have your love life. You have your work life. You mm-hmm. have your, your DJing and producing bag. You have your friends. Mm-hmm. Like, your fan. How do you find a balance, Um, I think that that's something that's evolving every day, you know, I think you make time for the things that you love and I was in a position where, you know, maybe in relationships of the past where I was like, oh, I don't want to be in this because I don't have time for you, you know, and then you meet somebody that you really love and you really want to make time for Uh, and it's like now I now I'm bringing you to these spaces with me. I'm carving out time for you. You know what I'm saying? When it comes to music, it's like. I know that that's my job too. So I have to carve it out. Just like a nine to five is carved out for you, I'm carving out time for my girl, for my music, for my producing, you know what I'm saying? For my family, like, it's been hard to see my family up in Oregon because they're in uh, Oregon. I can and, imagine. And the time that I have really to go see them is the weekend and I'm working now, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, but yeah, just like, yeah, carving out time for the things you love, man. So it's like you haven't figured it out, but you're working through it, mm-hmm. like in real time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I don't ever want my girl to think that like I'm I'm not spending time for her, or I'm not carving out time for her. You know what I mean? Yeah. And when it comes to my friends, like now a lot of my friends are doing the things that I'm doing. You know what I'm saying? Or at the places that I'm doing. So a lot of times I've seen these people, my friends, are out. You know? Yeah. Or going to go out, like going to dinner to go out. You know what I mean? I, I haven't been like hanging out like I used to. You know what I mean? Things Playing are different FIFA now. and stuff like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like now it's like we're actively hanging out either at a show, playing a show together, mm-hmm. you know, getting some food. Yeah. Um, so it's just kind of like happening in real time for yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I see what you mean, man. I, when, I, when you say that, I kind of think about like quantifying. You know what I mean? Because it's easy to say like, like I want to do this. I want to make time for this. I want to do this. But like, what does that actually look like? You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, are you actually doing something to make time for the said thing that you're trying to like put mm-hmm. more attention to? And me personally, it's it's been hard to find that balance because I have a girl. I have this that I'm doing. I have my work life. I have my family life too. I have my friends. It's like constantly struggling to yeah. <laughs> find that perfect balance. And it's, and it's having, hopefully having people around you that give you that grace as well. Yeah. You know what I mean? To like find out what works. You know, I've been in sessions and I've, I've lost friends really oh, over really? the fact that like, look, I'm coming to you from work. 
I'm going to a studio session session from work. I'm in a suit. You see me in a suit. You know what I mean? I have to sit down with you and make a song. You know, it's gonna take however long, but I gotta go, bro. I'm tired too. I'm also coming on my lunch break. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then I leave and it's like, bro, you don't ever stay, you don't ever this, you don't that. You know what I'm saying? So it's like That's important. Finding people who give you grace, bro. hundred percent. You know, because mm-hmm. I understand their point you know, their point of view. If they're doing that full time and like this is their time, you know, this is their work day. Yeah. But it's also your downtime. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's like yeah, you just gotta have that grace for people, man. Finding people that understand mm-hmm. what you're going through. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it seems like your girl understands that, and like yeah. a lot of your good homies do. Yeah, and it it seems like, especially with my girl, like it's it has we haven't been dating long, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But it seems um, she has her passions as well, and and so it's we we do well with that. Yeah, you know? absolutely. That's always that, that's always helpful, mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah, no, I think that's important, bro, because. If you have people in your life that aren't really um, as understanding, they want to like they're competing with your passion more mm-hmm. than like supporting it. I think that yeah, that's bro. only a recipe for disaster. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely, bro. Yeah, we've been in that, those situations. That is, it's like not fun, bro. And it's no. like why am I losing my friends, bro? Like I'm just yeah. doing what I want to what I want to do. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And because yeah. at the end of the day, like with all these things happening, at some point one of them is gonna end up suffering at different points. Like, you know what I mean? It's gonna mm-hmm. fluctuate. Like sometimes, you know, your time with your family's gonna suffer. Sometimes your time with your girl's gonna suffer. Sometimes your whatever the case may be. And it's like important that they understand that it just comes with, you know what I mean, your yeah. lifestyle. Yeah, and, and it's something that I'm starting to understand as well, or starting to see in myself too. When I, when I go into situations after I'm very tired or after I've done a lot of stuff, I'm like a shell of a human, bro. You know, I'm just yeah. there and, I, and I'm like, man, I feel bad that I can't give you the energy that you need. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because I want to, I just can't. Yeah. You're you know not I mean? doing you're not doing yourself any good. You're not doing that person any good. And it's like a sacrifice that you have to make though. You know, if you want it, if you really want it, you know what I'm saying? It's like a sacrifice that you gotta make. You'll make it happen. Absolutely, bro. Cool, man. We're, we're we're coming close to the end of this. I just want to see if you have any like advice for for any like creatives out there that are, you know what I mean, looking to make it in whatever field that they have. Do you have any like, you know what I mean, words of encouragement or anything you want to share to uh, to people who, you know, you may have been in a similar situation of. Yeah, man. I mean, I think it's just coming down to building a good foundation, whether it be people, networking or building a community, man, and just kind of growing together, finding people that are interested in the same things that you're interested in and that will, that are willing to help you grow and help them grow and together, like, you get to a point where everybody's doing well and everybody's, you know what I mean? But I think that it's finding the community, building with that community, and not trying to go for the, the, the you know, the high apples where it's like, I'm gonna meet this person and he's gonna change my life. It's like, no, change each other's lives together. Yeah, you know? yeah. Build something, really build something, you know? And if, if you go in it with a genuine heart, I think in the, in the long run, you're gonna be so happy that you did it. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it's, you, you're a perfect testament of that. You know what I mean? You've lived that mm-hmm. and I feel like you're a perfect person to be saying that to people because you've experienced it in your own life. Yeah, I mean, I can only say what I, what I you yeah. know, what I live or what I see but for me, if I was, you know, I still am trying to make, you know, mm-hmm. trying to make it, whatever. It's like, that's what I, that's what I find success in, is building community and building relationships. Got you. Very well said. I love that. Mm-hmm. What, where can people find your work if they want to tap in with you, whether it's on socials and anything yeah. you want to plug? Yeah, man. Um, G. Carter on IG, TikTok. Um, I think I'm Gianni on SoundCloud. And then, yeah, man. Awesome, bro. Yeah, well, man, I appreciate you coming through, making time for this. I know you're a busy man, and I, I don't need to tell you this, but just keep being a solid person, bro. I love watching, watching what you do, and to even get to know you now and being, being able to realize how genuine you are, it's really refreshing to see, especially just, you know, given the times that we're in, I think that you, you got big things coming for you, and I'm gonna be tapped in with you, bro, so I appreciate you. Bro, I appreciate it. And I told you, you know, off, off, uh, off camera, been a big fan of yours. I'm honored to be here. Thank you. I've been watching this. You know, I was just like waiting for the day where 
I was cool enough to be on this. <laughs> nah, I was like, bro, all my all. friends are on here, bro. All my <laughs> friends are on here. Had to get you on, bro. Yeah, bro, I appreciate it, man. Yeah, of course, man. I appreciate it. We'll have to do this again in a couple years. Yeah. Tap in. We'll probably both be at some new levels. and Yeah, maybe on a yacht somewhere. Yeah, hey, we can do that. <laughs> I'm going to be tapped in, in the events too, bro. So I appreciate you, bro. Awesome. Well, Thank from you. Ambiance, Johnny Carter and Levi, we out. We appreciate you.